So in this lecture, we're going to talk about optics, the science of light. And there are really three different mental pictures of light that we're going to talk about in, in, this, um, in, in this lecture, or in, in our study of light. The first is what's sometimes called geometrical optics. In geometrical optics, you think of light as composed of rays. That is to say, light is a phenomenon that, that, that travels along straight lines through a uniform medium, and, uh, and our rules about optics will be rules about how those straight lines are directed. So light as rays. The second style of optics is sometimes called physical optics, or wave optics, because in, in this picture, light is, is a wave propagating through space, an electromagnetic wave, as we'll see. And so that's physical or wave optics. And finally, there's quantum optics, in which we view light as composed of little irreducible packets of energy called photons. Now, we're going to talk a lot about quantum optics um, uh, later in the course, uh, a great deal about photons, but for now we're going to set that aside, and we're going to concentrate on physical optics, light as waves, and geometrical optics, light as light rays. Now, here's a diagram that shows what we mean when we say that light is an electromagnetic wave. The electric and magnetic fields constitute the wave function, the thing that depends on space and time. And we'll concentrate on the electric field, partly because it's the electric field that's responsible for most of the, um, most of the, uh, the interaction of uh, light with ordinary matter. But, uh, so, so let's just concentrate on the electric field. The, um, the direction of the electric field in a light wave is perpendicular to the direction of propagation of the wave. And um, that means that light is a transverse wave. The, uh, the, the wave function is related to something that is perpendicular to the wave, like the wave on a stretched string. But unlike sound wave, which is not a transverse wave, the motions of the, uh, of the air molecules are, are in the same direction as propagation of the sound wave. <coughs> Um, and um, uh, the rule of thumb here is that the direction of propagation of light is um, in the direction of the cross product E cross B. Okay, so what is the speed of a light wave? Well, that speed is called C. C uh, stands for the Latin word caleritas, which means speed. So the speed of light is C, and it has a value of... 299,792,458 meters per second. And that number is an exact number. It's exact because we define the length of the meter so that the speed of light has exactly this value in empty space. Um, of course, Nobody needs nine significant figures for a, for a practical calculation, and so um, uh, for our purposes, it's perfectly good to take the speed of light to be 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, and that's pretty fast. Electromagnetic waves come with an, all kinds of wavelengths and frequency and only a fairly narrow range corresponds to the range for visible light. So at the longer wavelength, lower frequency end, you have radio waves, then microwaves, then infrared radiation. Finally, you have visible light, which is a very narrow range of wavelengths from about 750 nanometers down to about 400 nanometers, a nanometer being 1 billionth, 10 to the minus 9th meters. And then you, uh, and then you uh, go on through ultraviolet um, um, light, which is shorter wavelength than 400 uh, nanometers, and then to, to x-rays and gamma rays. So we can do a simple calculation with what we know. If you listen to local radio, you'll know that, um, that the frequency of Mount Vernon Station WMVO is 1300 kilohertz. And uh, that's 1.3 times 10 to the 6th cycles per second in the radio signal from WMVO. And so we can figure out the wavelength of the radio waves from WMVO. And, uh, and that's uh, speed of light C divided by the frequency, which works out to about 231 
meters. That is to say, there are, there's 231 meters of space between the successive points in space at which the transverse component of the electric field is greatest in the radio signals being emitted from the, uh, from the uh, antenna on, on uh, Radio Hill uh, at the, uh, in the outskirts of Mount Vernon. The wavelength of visible light, on the other hand, is much shorter. Let's consider orange light, which has a convenient um, wavelength of about 600 nanometers. That's 6 times 10 to the minus 7th meters. And from that, and the speed of light, you can work out the frequency. And when you work it out, you get 5 times 10 to the 14th hertz. That's 500 terahertz, which is a stupendously high frequency. So visible light has very short wavelength, less than a millionth of a meter, and very high um, frequencies in the hundreds of terahertz range. Now we've been talking about light is in, in physical optics terms, light as electromagnetic waves. How does that relate to geometrical opti optics terms, light as a, um, as, a, uh, as, a, as a sort of light rays propagating through space? Well, let's take a, a snapshot in time of the light wave. Here's the source of the, of the light waves. And in a snapshot of time, we could draw surfaces in space, which uh, correspond to, let's say, the, um, the, the places where the transverse component of the electric field is greatest. These are the, 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 uh, the, the peaks, uh, the crests of the wave, if you will. We, we'll, we'll give these the generic name, these surfaces the generic name, wave fronts. Now, the waves propagating outward from the source, and the wave fronts are concentric spheres around the source, and the, and the, um, uh, the, the light rays, therefore, go in the direction of the propagation of the wave, which means the light rays go straight out from the source. The point here is that the light rays are perpendicular to the wave fronts. That's, how, that's what, where the light rays should be drawn, perpendicular to the wave fronts. This means that if we, we have a statement about how the light wave rays go, we know how the wave fronts are shaped. And similarly, if we know how the wave fronts are shaped, we know how the light rays go. The point is, the light rays point in the direction of the propagation of the wave fronts. Ray optics is especially useful in, uh, in understanding uh, how light reflects from a smooth surface. So let's imagine that we have a, a, a smooth surface, uh, like a mirror or a, or a plate of glass, and we imagine light um, impinging on it. And so we can, we can um, describe that light by means of an, an incident ray, actually a whole bunch of incident rays all over the place, but let's, let's consider a particular incident ray um, it strikes the surface, and then that the, the light propagates away from the surface along what's called the reflected ray. These are the directions of propagation of the wave. wave. Um, how can we um, uh, how can we connect the uh, the incident ray to the reflected ray? What's the law that governs reflection? And of course, you know that law. It's very easy to figure out. It, it helps to define the law by drawing a, uh, a, a perpendicular line to the surface, the normal to the surface. Normal, of course, is a mathematical term for perpendicular. A normal to the surface, and then to define angles, um, giving the, the angle at which the incident ray approaches the surface, theta sub i, and the angle of reflection, the, um, the angle between the normal and the reflected ray, theta sub r. And so uh, the law of reflection now can be stated in very simple terms. That the, um, that the angle of incidence, theta sub i, is equal to theta sub r, the angle of reflection. That's the law of reflection. And there's a, a sort of a subsidiary law, which I, I, I'm, I'm not really telling you, but that's, um, that is that the normal, the incident ray, and the reflected ray all lie in the same plane. The law of reflection tells us a lot about how reflecting surfaces like mirrors work. So let's just imagine we had an object, a candle, say, sitting in front of a flat, plain mirror. Um, and we can imagine light rays that uh, emerge from the object in all directions. Let's consider a few of them that go toward the mirror. 
And at each point where the light ray strikes the mirror, the law of reflection holds. The angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. And so the light rays go out like so. But suppose we're, we're looking at the, the reflected light um, uh, from the candle. Those light rays that reflect off of the mirror appear to come from a point that's, that's actually behind the mirror. There's nothing really there, but the light rays are, are spreading out as if they spread out from that point. In other words, what happens is that, is that we see the light coming from the mirror as if there were an object, really it's an image, um, located behind the mirror. This is, a, uh, uh, this is the kind of, um, of geometrical construction that we can, that we can uh, do if we consider reflection by way, means of ray optics. You can think about how, how images form. Images aren't real things. They're just the places where the light rays that reflect off the mirror appear to come from. Now we're going to talk about how light propagates through a transparent medium. Um, not empty space, but perhaps air or water, or glass. And to study how that occurs, we need to introduce the concept of the index of refraction called N. N is the index of refraction. And the point is this. The speed of light in a medium is not the same as the speed of light in empty space. Um, light moves more slowly in a medium like glass than it does through empty space. And the reason is that the electromagnetic field is interacting with the atoms of the glass, and that causes the, the net effect. For the, the net effect of that is for the, for the waves to propagate more slowly. So um, uh, what, how is the index of refraction related to the wave speed in the glass? It's very simple. The wave speed in the medium, V, is just the speed of light the, in a vacuum, C, divided by the index of refraction. So the index of refraction is a, is a dimensionless number. It, it has no units. And it, it always has a value greater than or equal to 1. So for example, let's think about the values of, a few, uh, of some indices of refraction for different materials. For a vacuum, of course, for empty space, uh, for a vacuum, n is just equal to 1 exactly. 1 exactly. 1 followed by all the zeros. <clears throat> for air, air is, a, is, is not very, uh, is not very dense, it's very sparse, it's almost a vacuum in some sense. And so, not surprisingly, the index of refraction under ordinary conditions is um, close to 1. In fact, it's about um, 1.0003, practically, practically 1. For something a, 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 a bit more dense, let's, let's think about water. The index of refraction of water is 1.333, a, a convenient um, uh, value to remember. Uh, and um, well, uh, uh, so, so this means that light moves um, about 3 quarters as fast in water as it moves in, um, in, in a vacuum because uh, the index of refraction is close to 4 thirds. And so when I divide C by 4 thirds, it's like multiplying it by 3 fourths. Um, how about glass? Well, that depends on the exact kind of glass you're talking about. And typically, the ranges of, of, of index of refraction you see for glass um, uh, is ranges from about 1.5 to maybe 1.8 for very, uh, for very uh, um, um, dense flint glass. Um, how high can the index of refraction go? Well, there are materials that have very high indices of refraction. Uh, one of them is, is diamond. That's useful to... to uh, it's, not the, it's not the highest, but it's pretty high. The index of refraction of diamond is about 2.4 something. I think it's 417. So, so uh, uh, that's a very high index of refraction in diamond. Visible light waves travel at a speed less than half the speed they travel in a vacuum. Of course, if the index of refraction changes the wave speed, that changes the relationship between frequency and wavelength. So if we were to, 
if we were to uh, consider orange light in um, in a vacuum recall, that had a, um, a wavelength of about 600 nanometers and a frequency of about um, uh, 500 terahertz. What if that orange light is, is propagating in transparent water? Well, it turns out that the color of the light is really related to its frequency. So the orange light in water still has a frequency of 500 terahertz. But the, uh, so that means that the, that if you will, the, the frequency of the light is the same as the frequency of light, let's call it F sub zero, the frequency of the light in a vacuum. But that means that the wavelength now must be shorter because the speed of light is slower. How much shorter? Well, let's work it out. The wavelength will be equal to the wave speed divided by the frequency. That's, of course, just equal to the speed of light divided by the index of refraction and also divided by the frequency, which is the frequency in a vacuum. And so you can see that's just equal to the wavelength in a vacuum divided by the index of refraction. So the wavelength of the light is shorter in the, in the water by a factor of the index of refraction. The index of refraction of water is about four-thirds, so the wavelength is about three-quarters what it is in a vacuum. Instead of 600 nanometers, about 450 nanometers. One of the important things about the index of refraction is it tells us how light rays bend at the interface between two transparent media. So suppose we have um, two media, let's call them A and B, and there's a flat interface between, like the surface of some water. A might be the air, B might be the water. And suppose we have light rays from the A side impinging on the surface and getting transmitted into the, um, into the, the other transparent medium. Uh, uh, the angles are not quite the same. The light rays bend at the surface. And we can analyze this sort of as before by drawing a, a normal line to the surface and defining angles theta A on the A side and theta B on the B side between the light rays and the normal. And it turns out that the index of refraction is related to the, um, is related to the, uh, the angles theta by the following law. That it's called the law of refraction, or also known as Snell's law, after um, um, the uh, physicist in the 17th century who discovered it. The, um, the index of refraction of A times the sine of theta on the A side is equal to the index of refraction of B times the, the sine of the angle on the B side. Uh, now, in this diagram, we can see that theta sub a I've drawn as being bigger than theta sub b. So what does that mean about the indices of refraction? That means that the sine of theta sub a is bigger than the sine of theta sub b, and so for equality, it must be that the uh, n sub a is less than n sub b. So this diagram would, would make sense if, uh, if on the a side I had something like air with a low index of refraction, and on the b side I had something like water or glass or something with a higher index of refraction. Now there's a really interesting way to connect the law of refraction to the wave picture of light. And this makes use of something called Huygens' principle, H-U-I-G-E-N-S. Um, but we're going to talk about it, that in class. That's where we're going to start on, uh, on, on Monday. So I'll see you in class.